right. So welcome everyone. This is Peter Smallage. Today is the 20th of September and we're at our noon session. We're going to be joined in just a minute by Paul Catanzaro. Uh, I'm the, I am the New York State Extension Forester uh, based in Ithaca, New York, working throughout New York State and uh, it's my pleasure to work with woodland owners and foresters and maple producers and every and everyone and all who's involved with managing our rural lands, mostly private lands. And uh, one of the, the program that I run is called Forest Connect. You can learn more about that at forestconnect.info. One of the programs that I run is this monthly webinar series where we're joined by uh, really fabulous speakers, and Paul has been a speaker on several occasions in the past and has held the record for most attendees. I think that's been um, broken, but for a while, Paul was the, the champion, and, uh, and, and for good reason, because he always gives a great presentation. Today, Paul's going to be talking about increasing forest resiliency for an uncertain future. And with that, Paul, I'm going to mute my microphone and turn it over to you. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for inviting me, Pete. You know, I, I this uh, webinar series that you've developed over the last however many years, it's been five, seven years, has really been tremendous. And I know it's set the precedent and the bar for people across the country. So you were one of the first to adopt this and, and get this going. So appreciate what you do across the region and across the country to, to offer this kind of content in a, in a way that we can all access without mileage and, and, and with eliminating a lot of drive time. So thank you. Could I have, if it's possible, for those of you that um, are on the chat box, could you just type in what your role is? I recognize a number of names as foresters, um, but I'd be real curious to know if you're a forester, if you are a land use planner, if you're a landowner, um, whatever, whatever your role is, land trust, you know, however you want to frame that, but I'm just trying to get a sense of, of how many people are uh, from, what, from what background. Great, great. Good, a real mix, that's great. Master forest owner, I love it. Great, um, so uh, let me start. Uh, I appreciate you doing that. It just uh, helps me frame my, my comments a little bit better today for you. Uh, I wanna start by just acknowledging my uh, collaborators, Tony D'Amato at the University of Vermont and Emily Silver Huff at Michigan State. Um, like any good product in, in life, uh, it's usually a team effort and, and that was certainly the case here. Um, I also wanna acknowledge that, that the work we've done here is, is as much, I think, a synthetic piece as it is new content in the sense that we've, we've tried to do our best to pull together the wonderful work that others have been doing and are doing on this topic and put it into uh, a framework that, that we think will, will help people, uh, critical decision makers like yourselves on the ground, make good decisions about, about forest resiliency. So I, I just wanted to start with that. And, I, and, and before we let me see here. All right. There we go. Sorry. Uh, before we actually even start with, with most of the content, I, I want to just go over what we mean by resiliency. And so there's a definition there on the screen that you can read for yourselves. But um, resiliency falls typically on a gradient between resistance which would be shaping forests uh, and, and really just maintaining their condition in, in the hopes that they will be resistant to whatever stressors they're facing. So that would be on, on one end of a gradient. On the other end of the gradient, you consider um, actually transitioning the species and structure of a forest and changing the condition into uh, a forest that uh, will be um, more resistant and resilient over time to, to what we feel is coming down the line. So, so that uh, resistance on one end, transition on the other, and, and resilience would fall in some ways right in the middle there, that, that you're maintaining some of the, the dominant conditions of the forest um, while at the same time keeping an eye um, on where the puck is heading and how you might be able to change the species and composition of your forest and, and, and um, to, to make sure it's ready for what might be coming down the line. So, when we talk about forest resiliency, that, that's the space that we're really operating in. I wanna be very clear up front 
that uh, our forests have faced a, a number of stressors, a number of challenges uh, over the past however many decades and, and centuries and, and eons. Um, some of these examples are, are admittedly very northeast, and, and I apologize for our, our friends out in other region parts of the country. But um, similar, I'm sure you have similar examples uh, in your neck of the woods. But you know, chestnut tree blight, uh, chestnut blight came through. Um, the 1938 hurricane was a very big uh, hurricane event that that did tremendous amounts of of, um, uh, of a huge disturbance in New England, parts of New York. Um, certainly, past land use history of clearing for agriculture or clearing for timber and so forth. So, so our forests have really been affected by a tremendous amount of stressors over time. And the good news is, of course, and you all know this, that our forests have a, a tremendous amount of inherent resilience to them. Our forests, our landscapes uh, very much want to grow for us. If you stop mowing your lawn, you're going to end up with a forest at some point. Um, the question to me is, um, will the forests in the future provide the types of benefits we're looking for from our land. We're going to have forests. So I, th th that I, I'm confident in. The question is, will the species composition of the forests, will the actual structure of the forest be what we're interested in, in terms of what kind of benefits they're providing? So I think the good news is, I, I don't want to be here and suggest that the world is ending, that our forests are, are going to die off. I, I, I think past has shown that that's just not the case. You know, we have relatively young, young soils that are relatively nutrient rich. We get ample precipitation. You know, we just, our, our landscapes want to grow these wonderful forests. They're going to provide benefit. The question is, what will the species and structure is and be, and, and what benefit, therefore, will it provide? So, to me, that's an important point to start off with. Of course, we are facing an increasing number of forest stressors. Um, and, and I, we can go right down this list, but, but certainly forest conversion uh, and, and invasive plants, you know, um, interrupting forest regeneration, invasive insects and disease. It seems like almost each month I turn around, there, there's a new uh, insect to, to be concerned about, whether it be emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, hemlock woolly adelgid, et cetera. Um, there's an increasing amount of invasive insects and disease um, the global community has gotten much smaller, for better or for worse, and, and those are effects that we're dealing with. Uh, deer brows, for some people, um, may seem to be um, an odd thing to put up here, but depending on what part of the country you're in, deer can, can and ha are having a tremendous impact on our forests in terms of the amount of regeneration that's allowed, in terms of the complexity of our forests and simplifying those structures, and, and really Sort of setting them up or, or predisposing them to, to, uh, to issues encouraging invasives and so forth. And of course, um, climate change. You know, the, this is a, the 800 pound gorilla in the room, but when we talk about climate change, we're talking about things such as um, more frequent and more intense big events, disturbances. So um, there's no better time, I guess, to talk about that than, than looking at the hurricanes that have been developing out, out in the Atlantic. There's just more energy in the system, which produces more storm events. Those storm events tend to be more intense. So what, what's predicted to happen are, are having more uh, wind events, particularly up here in the Northeast in New England, which is our major disturbance, more wind, more ice. So having them more frequently having them uh, be more intense, um, having more intense uh, thunderstorms that are, you know, uh, can, can drop two or three inches or three or four inches at a time. But between those large events, having really droughty conditions. So these are, these are challenges that we're facing um, in terms of the current stresses on our forest. And again, to go back, it's not as if our forests have never faced stress in the past. But it is likely that our forests currently are facing more stress, and those stresses are increasing in frequency and intensity than we've seen in the past. And how our forests will adapt to that is, is something we don't know. Importantly, I think it's important to realize that these stressors don't exist in silos. So it's not as if we're just dealing with climate change 
It's not as if we're just dealing with invasive plants. It's not as if we're just dealing with invasive insects or deer. All of these stressors act together, and so they increase their negative impact by their interaction. So I've just got a couple of examples here. Um, we are experiencing in New England uh, anywhere from probably a week or two weeks longer of a growing season, particularly on the, on the spring end of that. We obviously have more CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, we have more frequent and more intense storms. All of those things likely favor the initiation and spread of more invasive plants in the sense that one of their strategies is to get out before leaf out in the spring, establish themselves, you know, make a lot of sugars and, and be able to grow fast. Uh, the CO2, because they're fast growing species, they can take more advantage of that than slower growing plants because they're more frequent, more intense storms. We're likely going to see bigger gaps, more frequent gaps in the canopy, which exposes more light, which is just an opportunity for those invasives to establish or spread. Similarly with the deer, the deer preferentially browse native plants. That's logical. Those are the plants that they've evolved with. That too can favor invasive plants. Things like increased temperatures, you know, aren't keeping diseases and insects potentially in check like we'd hoped. A great example of that is the hemlock woolly adelgid. I know 10 or 15 years ago when I started my career, there were great hopes that, that the hemlock woolly adelgid would, would sort of reach the ceiling of, of you know, a cold zone whether it be in Massachusetts or, or more as it got up into northern New England, but we're just not seeing that, particularly in the coastal areas where it's mediated by the ocean. So these, uh, these stressors, uh, they interact, and they can amplify one another's uh, negative impacts on our forests. So one of the things that we, when we got together to develop this publication, we really focused on was just that fact that there are a lot of excellent resources out there that deal with these issues individually. There are wonderful uh, publications on invasive uh, plants. There are um, uh, wonderful work being done on the climate change issue, but there isn't necessarily work being done that, that sort of ties that together. And if you're a, a forester, if you're a landowner, um, you really need to be thinking of them in a more comprehensive way synthetic way because you don't want to be going in to do uh, develop silvicultural prescriptions when there are invasives in the area, uh, for example, or without dealing with, with deer issues because it just, your ultimate end goals, you know, uh, are likely not going to be met. So there are wonderful resources out there. Our goal was to try to create a framework that would help critical decision makers like yourselves um, be able to access the information, and, and get a sense of how that you can approach your woodland or the woodland you manage or the woodland you care about in a way that will help uh, increase the resiliency of those sites. And, and that's really, as I said, the synthetic part of what we did. And, and the original content is, is putting it into the framework and, and helping people uh, boil down the science, so to speak, to try to make it as, as, a, as applied as possible. So let's talk about some of the characteristics of what a resilient forest would look like. What, if you were to say, if you were to be able to wave your magic wand on the forest you're managing or you own or you care about, what would some of those characteristics be within your forest? Uh, the first thing I would say, and this doesn't apply to certainly everybody, I know there's a number of public lands managers out there and maybe working for a land trust and, and so forth, but if you're working with private landowners as a consulting forester or you're a landowner yourself, I would encourage you to develop some sort of formal plan to pass the land on in a way that maintains it in as big of a parcel as possible and is with as much forest cover as possible. It's quite simple that if we don't have forests, we just don't enjoy those forest benefits. And based on the average age of a landowner, and the intergenerational transfer of assets that we're seeing in this country, which is the biggest we've ever seen, this is critical. Obviously, just maintaining the forest, maintaining our options for stewardship based on the parcel size, maintaining the amount of forest cover uh, is critical. Now, life is messy. That doesn't necessarily mean that the entire thing, you know, needs to be conserved or, or passed down. I mean, we all would like our kids, I think we would all like our kids to live with us. Most of us would like our kids to live near us. But, you know, whether it's pulling out a house lot or two for children or for making sure you've got enough financial compensation uh, after you retire, whatever that is, um, putting that down on paper, 
developing a, a will, a trust, a limited liability company, looking into a conservation easement, current use is a wonderful tool, some combination of those tools that allow a landowner to pass on land in as big of a parcel as possible with as much forest cover as possible is, is, is a, in a critical, really foundational characteristic of a resilient forest. So if you're working with private landowners or you're a private landowner yourself, please integrate this into part of your work. Minimal forest stresses. Each landscape has a unique combination of stressors. So I just went through that list of invasive insects and plants and, and deer and, and climate change and so forth. Depending on where you are, depending on the proximity to urban areas, depending on the proximity to known invasive insect infestations or where there are lots of invasive pests or the deer population, each of us in our landscape are gonna be facing a unique combination more or less of these stressors. And so it's important to minimize the amount of stress on these forests and we'll get more into that after, but certainly in a, a critical, again, another critical characteristic, minimizing forest stress. High forest complexity. We're all learning, we're all moving forward, we're all taking our best guess as to, as to what, you know, what will be the best approach in the future and it's not, you know, it, it seems fairly logical, straightforward then to talk about things like a diversity of tree species so that if, a, uh, if an insect comes through, for instance, the emerald ash borer, your, you know, your forest, it doesn't have a high proportion of stems or basal area and ash. Maybe it's diversified a little bit. We know different disturbances, different insects, different diseases. Um, manifest themselves or um, have impact on different parts of the forest. So whereas a wind event may have a higher damage on large trees with big crowns, um, you want to have a diversity of sizes. If there's fire, that could have a higher proportion of damage on the smaller trees. Um, depending on insect choice, uh, you know, sometimes they, depending on the insect, may go after a more mature tree, they may have to go, go after a less mature tree. So really just talking about a diversity of tree species, tree sizes, tree ages, and really making sure that we're not putting all of our eggs in one basket. And, and silviculture is, is a wonderful way to do that. Um, I'm gonna get into a little more depth on this one for a couple of reasons. One is that you know, we have a number of foresters in, in, the, in the crowd. And so I think this is of interest to them. But also, uh, I think in terms of my experience in presenting this content to people, landowners and others that aren't foresters, this, this is an area that, that, that they're less comfortable with or just know less about. So I want to get into this idea of high forest complexity as a function of forest resiliency. So as I mentioned, um, having a diversity of tree species is very helpful. It may be that you um, want to encourage or transition a, a cohort or transition your entire forest into species that are predicted to be more competitive over the long haul. This is a table from our, and I'm sorry to our friends that are outside New England, and it doesn't even look like New York exists, but it actually does, I, I promise you. Um, and these ecoregions, um, you know, would carry through, particularly in New York, uh, you know, the orange being in the northern part and, and that lime green being more the southern part, but you can get a sense of uh, what species are predicted to do well and be more competitive uh, and what species are predicted to be less competitive in the future. And this table comes right from the publication we put together. So there are two columns. One says low emissions and one says high emissions. And the low emissions and high emissions refers to the models that predict the competitiveness of these species, and they've used models that have a low emission scenario. So what happens if we all stopped emitting carbon or, or certain policies were enacted? What would that look like in terms of the future models of, of climate change? And what happens if you know, we maintained our levels of emissions or increased those? What would those two sideboards be and how might they differ for the species competitiveness over time? And some of the species Species don't show a real difference, but some of the species show a difference between low and high emissions. Uh, so what we try to do is generally order the species from those that are less suited, less competitive, 
to those species working down the columns in the bottom that are predicted to be more competitive. And this is all based on the US Forest Service Tree Atlas, which is a wonderful resource that I would encourage you to refer to uh, if you're interested to know more about your area or about a particular species. We've also put in the bottom of that table some species that um, you, you really want to consider uh, in terms of their, their known um, forest health issues. So obviously ash, the emerald ash borer, the hemlock, hemlock woolly adelgid, and, and so forth. But making sure that your forest has a diversity of species, species at least that are suitable uh, over time, that don't have forest health issues, um, is an important characteristic of a resilient forest. Complexity uh, in regard to structure. When we talk about structure, and I've already used that term a couple times, we're talking about the different elements of a forest, uh, overstory, understory, shrub layer, herb layer, standing dead trees, down dead logs, all of those things are the structure of a forest. And we also need to take a look at not only what parts we have in a forest, but also how those parts are laid out because not all structure is the same. And depending on the, the spatial, depending on what structure is there and the spatial arrangement of those parts, we will get different environmental conditions within that forest. So, so let me be really simple here. So this is simple forest structure, right? It doesn't get much simpler than this. Red, red pine plantation on the left, uh, white pine plantation on the right. Um, you see very uh, obviously <laughs> the same species, um, pretty much the same exact sizes in terms of the DVH, um, no understory, no midstory, very little regeneration on the ground. Uh, very little dead wood debris on the ground. Uh, don't see any snags in the picture. So on the one extreme, this would be what we would consider very simple structure, and all of the trees are uniformly more or less spaced, very uniform. So this would be an example of a forest that has high forest uh, complexity uh, in, uh, in terms of its structure. So the picture right in the middle is actually a picture of old growth forest in Massachusetts. It has trees of different species. It has trees of different diameters. It has an herbaceous layer there. Uh, around that, we have complexity in terms of the amount of dead logs, dead standing trees, even things such as crown architecture on the bottom left, even things like bark morphology, all of that provides a complexity that's, that, that creates a different environmental condition in the stand, uh, different environmental conditions across the stand, a diversity of environmental conditions, but also a host of, of a variety of different wildlife habitats that supports uh, both insects and invertebrates and, and, and so forth. So this would be a great example of high forest complexity contrasted to our simple complexity with those plantations. So I know this is a dopey, simple, cartoonish diagram, but I find it's effective because sometimes pictures of forest can be hard to pull apart. So we could have, let's see, what do we have there? Eight, 11 trees, very plantation-like, very simple structure. Um, this would give us very similar environmental condition across the stand, right? It wouldn't be necessarily open condition sunlight. It wouldn't be necessarily shaded condition. It would be for those foresters out there, something similar to, to like a shelter wood. So we'd have some dapple light, sort of moderate environmental conditions. We can have those same number of trees, we can even have the same size trees, all of those same things, but if we clustered those differently, if the spatial arrangement of the parts, so to speak, were arranged differently, we would all of a sudden have different conditions within that forest. So outside of that, of that reserve, of that group, of that patch, we would have very light conditions, high light intensities, it would be drier, and inside that group of trees, it would likely be much shadier, cooler, moister conditions. So with even the same trees, if you were to arrange them differently, you would diversify the environmental conditions within that stand. And what we're trying to do in terms of characteristics of resiliency is provide a diversity of those environmental conditions, a diversity of structure, a diversity of species, so that all of our eggs aren't in one basket, 
So no matter what comes down the line, be it insect disease uh, or natural disturbance such as a hurricane, um, there is likely going to be some parts of the forest that are susceptible to those particular stressors, but not all of it. To take this just one last step further, you can also think about the stand as being, um, and, and I know traditionally for us foresters, we oftentimes think of a stand as applying one silvicultural system to that individual stand. I'm going to do a shelter wood in that white pine stand, or I'm going to do a selection system in that northern hardwood stand, and then you sort of apply that across the stand that you've delineated because it has similar species and sizes and characteristics and so forth. But taking a look at diversifying, even within the stand, some of that uh, structure, certainly those species, can provide, even within stand, a diversity of environmental conditions that will help the forest be more resilient to, to whatever may come down the line. And I'm going to pick up on this thread later in the presentation with, with a, a, a specific example of, of maybe one approach. So high forest complexity, I want to bring this back around because remember I was talking about what are the characteristics of a resilient forest and one of those characteristics is high forest complexity, diversity of sizes, ages, um, stem distributions, um, species, etc. So, so again, obviously a critical component of a resilient forest is this high forest complexity, both in terms of species, but also structure as well. The spatial arrangement matters. Uh, an obvious um, characteristic of a resilient forest is, is healthy soil and water. This is the commons. This is what, what we all depend on. This is the foundation of, of any forest or any system. It, it, it's the place where um, Arguably, the most public benefit is derived in terms of clean water and healthy soils and so forth. So making sure that um, we have, and this gets right down to very applied things that you've all heard, using BMPs, using proper contracts, using, you know, laying out roads, um, flagging roads, uh, supervision of sales, et cetera, et cetera, uh, performance bonds, all of those things sound very you know, old fashioned, but, but a, a, a forest that's resilient is going to have healthy soil and water, and we can rely on some of our traditional tools uh, to, to accomplish that. Protection for threatened and at risk species. We will have, as Leopold would say, all of the cogs and wheels of our forest should be in place. So when we're looking at a diversity of, uh, of characteristics, of species, and so forth, to help increase our resiliency, we very much want to make sure we have all of our parts, endangered species uh, as well, and, and in particular, in terms of the role and function they play, also just the genetic diversity and so forth, to provide us to make sure that we can be um, dealing with any stresses that come down the line. So this could be a, a, you know, a, a, a threat endangered species that you would think of traditionally, but it could also be species that are less competitive. And, and for us in Massachusetts, we sit at the at the southern end of, of the spruce range, you know, we've got some high elevation spruce and, and so forth in Massachusetts. So for us, it, it may also be, you know, are there opportunities for providing refugia on north side slopes, on concave, you know, landforms that might have, you know, a little bit of cooler of a micro site? Are we, are we able to maintain some of these species uh, within our landscape to make sure we're, you know, uh, increasing the diversity or maintaining the diversity uh, over time. So those were characteristics of, of a forest itself, but we can't think about resiliency of a forest itself. Uh, importantly, we have to think about the context it's within, the matrix it's within, the landscape it's within as well. So um, the characteristics of a resilient forest at the landscape level would have low conversion rates, would have lots of forests. Those forests would be ideally connected, continuous forests, to allow the movement of, of species and migration of genes and, and, and animals and so forth. So we would have these large patches, they'd be connected, and we would want them on diverse soil and growing conditions. This is what uh, some, some colleagues of mine have referred to as you know, maintaining the stage, so to speak, that um, if we have a diversity of stages, the actors might change over time, 
but that diversity of stages will lead to a diversity of actors. So let's be more specific. If we're doing um, good work and, and, and working on diverse species and structure of all of our forests, and all of those forests happen to be in the middle of slopes, that'll be wonderful. But it will likely create great conditions for those species most competitive and adapted to those conditions. What we're hoping for, what would be ideal, is to have resilient forests at the top elevations, at bottomland or riparian areas, at mid-slope, at you know, and all different, in wet, in dry, um, in pine stands and in, in hemlock stands, which are really just the the uh, expression of those site conditions. So if we have sites with different moistures, with different conditions, and so forth, the species on those sites might change. But it's likely that a wet site's going to just have, you know, change to other wet species. Um, it, on those dry sites, we're going to, you know, the species might change, but they'll be the xeric species. And so in terms of maintaining diversity, looking at the landscape level, looking at diverse conditions is critically important. So if you're a land manager um, on a public land, or if you are a consulting forester, uh, or, and you have clients that are um, that have a diversity. Uh, excuse me, have multiple parcels, whether it be a municipality or your con org or a land trust that has different parcels. You know, focusing in on on what the the bedrock is, on what the topography and the physiography of those sites are, really trying to create some resiliency in different environmental conditions over time would be very helpful. So when you boil all of this down. When you boil down what makes resilient forests, when you boil it down, we really can really all fit into what we've said were four different goals. And so this would be the goal, these would be the goals of, of a resilient forest, that the forest is, maintains itself as forest and is connected to other forests, that you reduce the stressors, you've reduced the vulnerability of the forest itself, and you're providing refuge for those threatened uh, endangered species, but also those at-risk species too, like that spruce example. So these are the four main goals. And moving forward with this framework, the, uh, the prompts, the questions that, that, um, that the tool gives you, you know, are, are all based in achieving these four goals. Importantly, and this, this was something that, that was important in terms of my, my thinking, uh, because I and I should have admitted this up front, you know, I've been I've been hesitant to engage with the climate change work, and it just it always seemed like such a cluster, you know. I just I just had a hard time wrapping my arms around it. It's a big thing, you know. How do you affect it on the ground? Um, but but talking about it more as resiliency was was definitely eye opening to me. Um, talking about it more as an integrated approach as opposed to just dealing with climate change was helpful to me, and it was really helpful to think about it. Uh, from my perspective, uh, on a gradient. And, and I know as I've gone out and talked to other people, this has been helpful for them too. So uh, recognize that, that resiliency falls on a gradient, that you can have on the left side, high resilient forests with low vulnerability, and on the right side, low resiliency with high vulnerability. And, and most sites probably fall somewhere in between. So so every forest, the forest that you own or the forests that you manage or you care about, have some characteristics that are resilient. And as we talked about at the very start, all forests have inherent resiliency. So if it's got trees on it, it's got some resilient characteristics to it already. But it also has likely some characteristics that make it vulnerable. And as we talked about, those characteristics are, are likely landscape unique. So you may be dealing with EAB in your part of the world, you may not be. You may be uh, near some uh, areas that have a lot of agricultural fields and maybe that's induced some, uh, introduced some particular invasive plants. Um, so you would be dealing with a different suite of vulnerabilities. But every forest has characteristics that are resilient and some that are vulnerable. And so in terms of looking specifically and applying these principles to your forest, this becomes sort of a nice way to, to enter into the framework by asking what are the characteristics that make it resilient and what are the characteristics that make it vulnerable. So that's what we did. We framed our four goals, keeping forests as forests, reducing the stressors, you know, et cetera, the vulnerability and, 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 and protecting those threat engaged species and those at-risk species. So assessing your forest resiliency. And then we framed it in a series of, uh, I believe it's 15 different questions. 
So do you have a conservation-based estate plan if you're a private landowner or in reducing stressors? Are invasive plants found, are plants not found on or near the property? And it may be that you're able to just answer yes or no, and you know off the top of your head, particularly if you're a forester and you've walked that land quite a bit or you're a landowner that's very much engaged with your land, you may know. If you don't know, that's a, a natural next step. How do I find that out? Is that something that I can do myself as a landowner? Or is it best to contact a consulting forester or the state service forester or my local land trust? How do I find those things out? But walking through this step one will give you a sense of what parts of your land, you know, what are those characteristics that are resilient and what are those characteristics that may make that forest more vulnerable. And again, this is the, this we've distilled down the work that, that many people have done on, on resiliency, on climate change, on structure, you know, what are those, what are those cutoff points that can be easily assessed, okay, either a self-assessment or working with a professional and then implemented at the, at the property level. So these are the, the, the second slide for step one, which is just the sec, uh, excuse me, the third and fourth goals. And you can read down what those questions are. And admittedly, <laughs> some of those questions almost sound like double negatives and so forth. Uh, we tried very hard to make the questions all lean in the same way. So a yes answer is always resiliency and a no answer is vulnerability. So some of the phrasing uh, can be awkward. So I apologize for that. That was the best that we and, and all the copy editors could come up with. But you'll see some, some, some pretty specific things in there too. Are there five or more large snags, large um, uh, defined as you know, greater than 16 inches per acre? That comes from the literature. That comes from, from studies that have been done on, on climate change and on habitat and, and so forth. So that's the first step. And that first step should give you a sense of what are those characteristics that are uh, resilient and, and, and where are your liabilities? You know, what, what makes you vulnerable on your property? And if you have, and, and certainly you will have, characteristics that make your forest resilient, this is an opportunity to monitor those. Okay? Things change quickly in your forest, and you want to make sure that those characteristics that are resilient stay resilient over time. So just making sure and keeping tabs on them um, is, is, is the way to keep, you know, maintain those characteristics. Of course, there, there are likely going to be some characteristics of your forest that make it vulnerable, and that's your opportunity to take action. You know, is it a matter of um, dealing with an invasive population, uh, invasive plant population? Are there uh, invasive insects on your property, and, and how can you deal with those? Um, do you, if you're a private landowner, have a conservation-based estate plan? And if not, you know, those are all opportunities to move forward in a very discreet, applied way that is specific to your property and your individual landscape. We have framed um, these uh, action steps and, and really the whole, the whole guide, the whole publication, the whole framework uh, towards those critical decision makers out there. So when you look at the landscapes of the Eastern United States, um, much of it owned by family forest owners, an increasing amount of it owned by conservation organizations such as land trusts, municipalities or counties would fit into there. Um, those, you know, all of you are critical uh, drivers of, of that landscape as, as critical decision makers. And of course, obviously foresters who, who work, who can and are working with all of those groups. So there are uh, in these actions, you, you would see that um, there are some that are more appropriate for some audiences than others. In other words, uh, if it's a conservation-based estate plan, that's probably a, a, you know, a real specific one for the landowners. If there are land use planning opportunities, that might be most appropriate for a planning board, for instance, in, in, in a municipality. So we've tried to frame the action steps in a way that would be appropriate and, and directly applicable and specific to your landscape and property. And we have tried to identify those actions that we think would be most appropriate for these critical groups um, that are really controlling most of the land in, in the East United States. Now, that doesn't mean that my friends that are management foresters 
um, you know, none of this applies. Um, it just means we're trying to hit the majority of the landscape. So, so no disrespect certainly meant. Um, and I think as you look at the landowner and forester um, items, action items, you'll, you'll find those are very applicable for you as well. So um, this is just an example of these, this second step, this, this taking action. And I just happened to pull up, uh, I just didn't happen to do that, I guess. I, I intentionally pulled up um, this, the 3.1 action in terms of reducing vulnerability, which is promoting diverse species of various sizes, ages, and spatial arrangements. And as you can see, that's our forester icon. So this is a, an excellent opportunity uh, for foresters to get involved and, and increase the, and reduce vulnerability, uh, and in doing so, increasing the resiliency by looking at a diversity of, uh, of age classes, diversity of um, species, and a diversity of spatial arrangements. So silviculture is a wonderful opportunity to change this forest structure and species composition, as I say down there at the bottom of the slide. And, and, in, and in that way, you know, I think there is uh, a wonderful opportunity to engage with landowners that are concerned about this, uh, certainly conservation organizations and land trusts, or municipalities that want to know what they can do for climate change or to help their forests be quote unquote more healthy. Um, there are silvicultures, <laughs> silviculture are our old silviculture tools, you know, come in really handy. They can be applied in these ways. And I think that's a, a wonderful opportunity for us to, to work with maybe constituents or, or landowners that in the past uh, have not wanted to engage in silviculture. I want to just in, in that same vein, I just want to bring up just what I think is, is an interesting example of, of you know, how silviculture, how forestry might be able to uh, help reduce vulnerability by promoting diverse species at, and, and size, ages, and spatial arrangements. And this is just a, a silvicultural technique called a variable density thinning. And as I, as I teed up at the beginning of the presentation, when we talk about um, as foresters, we're taught to define stands uh, or management units as similar species sizes, etc. And then, you know, um, we oftentimes apply a standard treatment to that entire area. But the reality is, if you look at the if you look at the grid on the left, the black and white grid, if we look at the nature of our disturbance patterns in our area. What we see is we see very frequent uh, lower intensity disturbances. We see uh, wind, uh, we see uh, gaps being created, we see ice in individual trees or small groups of trees being, uh, being blown over or we see some insect damage and so forth. So we don't see necessarily large scale. Now they come through periodically. I showed that, that picture of the 1938 hurricane, but, but what we have seen historically more often are these frequent low intensity. So in a northern hardwood stand, it's been estimated that annually, you know, if you, if you averaged it out, you know, a, a northern hardwood stand would, would lose something like half a percent or a percent of its, of its canopy every year. So on the left, what's been mapped are, are the density of trees greater than eight inches. And this is for an almost 300 year old growth forest in the Northeast. And what you see is, you see a lot of variety. You see a heterogeneity within that stand in terms of both the structure, and this is just looking at the size, but based on that, I'm also assuming the, the species as well, based on different light levels and, and, and um, trees affinity for uh, competitiveness in those light levels. So if you take a look at that on the left, at how nature essentially structures the stand, um, and then you can translate that on the right. So creating, not treating the entire stand in the same way, but creating some, some different kinds of structural patterns within there, like we would see naturally emulated. So in this particular example, somewhere around 20% of the stand is what we would call a skip or, or a patch reserve, so, so you're not touching it. 20% or so in the yellow, which, is, which are these gaps. So you are creating, you are emulating natural disturbance in the pattern that we've seen historically. Now, again, that might change as we see more frequent and tense, but it starts getting at, you know, what, how we would see nature naturally structuring a stand. 
And then the majority, the matrix of, of the stand, um, that's 60% thinned. So we're increasing vigor using, you know, the, using what we know about silvicultural tools that we're increasing the vigor by providing more resources for those trees. Um, there is some interesting research being done on, on what that does to um, the drought tolerance of those individual species. And there, there's reason to believe that, you know, thin stand is going to be more vigorous and be able to stand up to those droughts. So the majority may be thinned out or, you know, increase the vigor of, but also introducing that environmental diversity by having these, this skip and gap pattern and not necessarily putting an entire, um, you know, system on one entire stand. And so if you were to play that out, you know, and I, I want to give credit to my colleague, Tony D'Amato, because these are actually his slides. But where might you implement that? Well, in those gap areas, you might look to where there are some advanced regeneration, you know, where, where you've already got some, some sugar maple started, you know, where you might already have some, some nice red oak or, or whatever species you're trying to favor in there. Those would obviously be areas, just as if you were laying out a shelter with, those would obviously be areas that would be nice opportunities to introduce a gap to release that regeneration. They can also be areas, obviously, that would initiate a cohort uh, as well. And in those skip areas, it may be that you want to look at things like what's the existing structure? You know, are there large snags and logs? And can we build on that? Is there a unique patch of vegetation? Or, you know, is that where the, the you know, spring ephemerals are? Or is there a particular plant that you want to you want to conserve or protect and, and, and placing the, 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 the uh, skip on that. Or maybe it's sensitive habitat like a vernal pool or, or some other characteristic. But, but using what you've got um, in terms of that 20% in that skip pattern, um, looking at evaluating the stand and then within that matrix, within, you know, increasing a vigor by, by doing a thinning. So I, I want to be, I just want to pause here because I'm not, I'm not advocating this as the silver bullet. I'm just, it, it just, the approach is, uh, is an interesting one to consider and it reinforces what we've talked about in diversity, in terms of a diversity of species and structures. And in, and in, and in doing that, um, we're increasing or diversifying the environmental conditions. So we've got some light areas, some moist areas um, that will help uh, or, or, or allow species with different kinds of competitiveness uh, competitiveness in different conditions to exist within there. And again, we're just diversifying. We're not putting all of our eggs in, in one basket, et cetera. And I actually accidentally advanced that slide prematurely. I'm sorry. But the point I wanted to make with this slide was that, again, we got to get outside of the stand level and even the property level, look within the landscape. So we want to try to have asynchrony across the landscape. So not all of our um, you know, for us are 80 to 100 years. So we have differences in not only species with, and, and structure within Stan, but also across the landscape, we also have a diversity of species and, and function and so forth. If you're a, a landowner, um, you know, just being aware of what's going on in your landscape is important. It's not as if you have control over your abutters. Um, so we recognize that, but that can really help inform what you do if there are mostly 80 to 100 year oak stands on, on all your abutters, then maybe, you know, diversifying that at a landscape level um, can make sense in terms of creating a more resilient landscape. If you're a, a management forester or a consulting forester with larger clients or, or clients with multiple parcels, um, you know, this is an opportunity to sort of do an evaluation at, at a broader view and make sure we're not just so focused on the in-stand condition that we're losing sight of the, of the bigger picture. And again, you know, remembering that our stressors interact, and this goes back to the beginning of the presentation, but, um, you know, obviously not just being so concerned about the climate change aspect that we're losing sight of the fact that we need to address, you know, what invasive plant is in there before we open up that canopy, or we need to address you know, the deer population, and I know that that's a hot topic and a difficult subject, but, but we need to address those stressors before we, we go right to the silviculture. And I know it's very tempting because um, that's what we love to do as foresters and, 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 there's, and there's great promise in doing it. But we have to do so cautiously, making sure that we're looking at all of these stressors as one complete picture. You know, the more 
folks I, I talk to in, in the region, you know, consulting foresters and management foresters, et cetera, the more, you know, it's becoming more and more obvious that a, a, just a standard part of the job these days in many landscapes is, is incorporating invasive plant control into your silviculture, which is not something we necessarily had to think about 10, 15, 20 years ago. But at this point, it's just becoming standard. So don't forget about, you know, the interaction of these stressors and how your approach or how your actions, you know, may unintentionally help them. So we want to make sure we minimize that risk. We put this publication together. I was asked to come to a conference and present it. And sure enough, the first hand that goes up asks the question, well, I'm going to end up with, you know, I'm likely going to end up with a number of actions that I can do. How would you prioritize that? And I thought to myself, son of a gun, that would have been a very good thing to put in the publication. And maybe we will uh, when and if we reprint it. But I wanted to address it now as we, you know, move forward during the presentation. To me, and, and, and take this with a grain of salt, you know, there's definitely, a, you know, personal bias in here, particularly that first bullet. To me, just being sure that we're maintaining forest is forest is, is the first, is the foundational step. If we don't have forest, you know, we're done. The rest of it's game over. So if you're a private landowner or you're a land trust or you're a consulting forest or working with private landowners, you know, encouraging them to consider their options, whether it be on the, in the, uh, on the less formal side, like a will or a trust, uh, whether it be a current use program, depending on your state, you know, that has a lien on the property that can be taken off, but it provides some sort of semi, you know, transferable protections in a term way, or whether it's all the way, you know, to a full-on easement, maintaining forest is critical. Beyond that, I would say, particularly if you're a landowner or you're a land trust or you're a municipality, let your resources, interests, and landowner actions guide you. It's, it's likely that not everyone, I hope you check all the actions off your list, but let's be realistic. It's not like, you know, everyone has an infinite amount of time or volunteer hours or money to go out and do all of this on all the forests. So, what, you know, what do you have the interest to do? What are the most pressing action items? What is the landowner interested in? Maybe the landowner is just interested in, in controlling invasive plants and that's a real passion and let him or her go out and, and guide them or, or help do that. Um, you know, or maybe your community has access to volunteer time from the Boy Scouts or whatever that is. And I would say just being able to do, start checking off any of these items in your action list is going to move you on that gradient from, you know, more vulnerable to less vulnerable, more resilient. So any action you do is going to help with that, and any action within the landscape is going to help. So if you're doing it, one of your actions, and your neighbor's doing one of the actions, you know, over time, that will, that will add up. So, so that, that's what I would say in terms of prioritizing actions. So I've gone through the first two steps. How do you evaluate it? What are those action items? And then the third step, which, which I think for many people can be anticlimactic, um, but is, is the monitoring evaluation. And this is, these are things we're not good at. You know, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily pay if you're a consultant. Um, you know, if you're managing public lands, there's always something else to do to, instead of going and taking a walk and really evaluating what, you know, what the impact of your actions were. But, but they are important particularly as we said up front, that we're seeing these stressors come in in a way that, 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 that's more frequent, um, there's more synergy between them. The stressors that are coming in, our, our, our systems aren't used to, so they have the potential of doing more impact, like the Emerald Ash Borer and the Asian Longhorn Beetle. So forests are dynamic, they're constantly changing. Um, just because you, you, know, you have a characteristic that resilient now doesn't mean it's going to stay there, or just because you don't have a stressor in your system now doesn't mean it's not going to be there. So evaluating that, monitoring that um, is, is important. And, and if, it's a, you know, if it's a land trust parcel or whether it's a, a municipal parcel, you know, this can be a great way to engage neighbors, citizen scientists to go out, monitor while you're you know, hiking or walking the dog or skiing or, or whatever it is. So when you add all that up, when you take the four goals, when you take the, the, the questions on assessment and you take the actions in step two, you know, end up with this framework that um, allows, I hope, people to, to digest you know, the wonderful science and work that's been done 
um, and distill it down and boil it down to 15 questions that I hope help motivate people to take action by feeling confident that they're, you know, addressing these, these uh, stressors in a, in a complete holistic way. So a couple conclusions. Um, and I guess I just gave the, gave the first one, but, but we, I, I so often hear us talk about the individual stressor. I, I think it's important for us, and I know if you're, you're out there doing it, um, the management on the ground, you know, I'm sure you're, you're being forced to integrate them. Um, but, but making sure we're considering all these stressors together, uh, remembering that the, the resiliency is on a gradient, you know, all four are inherently resilient, and you, as a landowner or manager, have the opportunity to move the land on that gradient one way or the other. Um, and being vigilant and implementing these actions is the way to do that. And I also want to be very clear that I don't necessarily see this as, a, as an end unto itself. I guess, I guess it could be. I guess someone could say that this is my highest priority. But um, I think all of these actions, you know, are completely compatible with uh, an organization's or a landowner's or a town's you know, desire to have wildlife habitat. I mean, I think that can be worked in um, to all of this, that it doesn't need to be an end in itself, that there's plenty of room for unique combinations of landowner goals. So if you're interested, um, you can download this as a PDF. Uh, um, there's both the booklet, but also there's a poster that you can see on the screen. Or if you want hard copies, let me know. I'd be happy to, to ship you out some for, fun, uh, for free, for fun and for free. And I just want to make sure that I acknowledge our, uh, our funding that allows us to send this out for free, which is the Renewable Resource, Resources Extension Act, RREA. And I also want to thank our partners at the Northeast Climate Science Center and the NIACs that you know, have been doing a lot of work in this way. And, you know, we were able to use their work and distill it and incorporate it into, into, our, uh, into our framework. And again, I want to thank Pete for this opportunity. And uh, I'd be happy to talk or answer questions. Paul, thank you very much. So we've got the first question. I'll just, can you bounce back a slide so that that oh. URL is there? Oh, sorry. There we are. Perfect. So uh, this was great. I really enjoyed this. I mean, that's one of the, the, the thrills that I get as the host is that I don't have to do any work. I get to see great presentations. Like, how much better does it get? <laughs> so and I'll use my prerogative. I've got, um, there's several questions that are already here, but uh, just to let people know a couple of things. If you're interested in continuing education credits, you've already taken care of what you need to do when you registered for the webinar. That's one thing. The second thing um, is that if you have questions, that this is the time to start to start writing those in. So please type those in. I've got a couple of questions to kind of get things warmed up, and then we'll turn over to the chat window. So, uh, one, Paul, I think this is this would be a neat. Um, It'd be fun to, to roll, not to roll this out because you've already rolled it out, but to, to portray this through a couple of case studies, you know, so you could work with landowner A or land trust B and kind of walk them through, here's what we used to do, here's, here's how we're going to do things in the future, here's what we had to change in order to um, align ourselves with this interest in increasing forest resiliency. Any, has that been done? Are there plans to do that? How, how, would that, how would that fit? Yeah, it hasn't. It's a great idea. Um, I know uh, Maria Janowiak um, over at the NIACs has been working in a number of states, and you go to their website and see where these these models or these case studies are being done. Um, so, so you know, there are there are some on the ground that are happening. I know she and others are planning to get more up and going. I guess, Pete, I haven't specifically done that, but but that would be a good uh, a good idea in terms of how much of this is business as usual and how much of this did, you know, did change or, and, uh, and affect what, what the people were going to do moving forward. Um, we have talked about doing a, an online tool on our website because it just, it just screams at it. I mean, it's just 15 questions that someone could work through and then, and then be able to produce, you know, sort of a, an action list. So, so that I think would be the next step, but I, the model is a very good suggestion. Mm. Um, kind of following on that, uh, there are many foresters that will work with clients that um, you know maybe aren't ready to jump in and go the full 15 uh, box checklist. So is there, 
which could you or would you or might you make a recommendation if there's just like one or two basic changes in I'll say operational philosophy. So when a forester's on the ground, what's the one or two most key things that they can do that will contribute to resiliency? Yeah, I would put them, I would put that back on the forester. He or she is gonna know there's such a unique combination in every landscape. You know, whether ALB is present in the landscape or could be, or what the conversion rates are, or what the invasives are. You know, I guess, I guess to me, that's the that's the art of it. That's the professional judgment. Uh, I, I also would, so so you're saying stressors. First thing to do is to yeah yeah. I, I think so. I, I think uh, I guess the first thing I would do is make sure it's going to stay forest if it's right. privately held. I mean, it's just otherwise your work is for naught. Um, and I would see what combination of stressors are there and, and where the will is. Uh, you might, you know, there may be something that really needs to get done, but you can't get there from here for whatever reason. Either it's funding or it's time or the landowner is uncomfortable with it. I think just making headway, I wouldn't let perfection be the enemy of good. Right. Okay. And then the third thing is that this would, this would be a very neat tool to capture in a revision to um, state and federal uh, stewardship planning templates, right? Yeah, this is something that, that we've talked about, at least you know, within Massachusetts, not, not that it be you know, sort of officially adopted, but, but you know, we hear more from natural resource managers. They want more information. Um, more landowners, I think, are asking about it. So I, I think it, I hope and it was meant to be something that can be taken in the field or done in the office after you've done your inventory. But yeah, I think, you know, you could, you could sort of march down the list and in a quick, you know, time with, with pretty much the same inventory data you have, you can sort of prioritize things, present a suite of options. I think the other thing I like about this is it allows people to enter the conversation where they're comfortable. Some people may not want to mess with species and structure. Silviculture may not be their thing or their organization may not want that or their community. So maybe invasives are the best place. So I think there are some good opportunities. And I think it could also guide a good conversation in terms of helping people focus in as a landowner really on what their goals are. Okay, good. So uh, with that delay, we've been, you've been flooded with questions, it looks like. Um, so can you see the questions, Paul, or do you want me to scroll and read them, or how do you want to approach them? Uh, <laughs> the only question is, is equity. Do I start with the first one or the last yeah, one? Yeah, start. You first. You got to go to the, got to go to the top. So, go to the top. All right. so scroll yeah. up, and it looks like there was. Yeah, call, call it out, Pete. That'd be helpful. All right. Um, the, so there's, so Carl has had several posts, many of them informational, some of them just observational. I would say just, but some of them informational, others observational. Um, let's see. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, I mean, this is, you, you know, your work on the ground is critical in terms of informing all this. This is, these are our best guesses. Who's kidding who? So, all right, here's one from Chris. Uh, what benefits or ecosystem services are likely to be impacted? And that was early in the presentation about 12.09 mm -hmm. p.m. So you were talking about, you know, changes and impacts on ecosystem services and benefits. What are there specific examples where you might see those benefits being reduced or impaired? Yeah, it's that classic answer. It depends, and it depends on the suite of stressors I think you're you're facing, and it depends on what the current species and structure of the forest are. So all forests all provide benefit in ecosystem services, but they'll provide them in different proportions based on their individual species and structure. So a red pine plantation is going to provide different uh, ecosystem services than a complex northern hardwood stand. Um, so I think some of the things that we risk uh, or that may be reduced from an ecosystem perspective are, are things like um, certainly water quality from a, from a you know, not have, from simplifying the structure if invasive plants are are taking over the understory things like uh, certainly wildlife habitats an obvious one you know if if um, invasives take over um, deer have uh, you know a real impact and are, are simplifying those forests. Um, 
yeah, I, I think those are the two that jump out at me most most logically. You know, timber is it is an ecosystem service. You know that that could have a, an issue as well. But uh, yeah, yeah, I guess that's what I would say. But but I would go back to that. You know, I think it depends on what you're starting with and what the stressors are. And if you have particular ecosystem services that you have a mandate for, whether you're a wildlife agency or whether you're a public water supply, you know, I guess those are the things I would key into from the action list. Like what what will help me maintain, you know, my, my directives. And that, I guess that's how I would prioritize. Okay. Um, and then Brian made an observation. There's a discussion of healthy soil and the role of soil organic matter. And he was just pointing out that he works in sand plain forests, which are inherently low in organic matter. Um, and that's, I mean, that's just nature of those particular soils. And, and I think that that's great. And Brian's done a phenomenal job on those sites. And, and I guess to me, that brings up the, the point of having a variety of sites. So we want some, some sand plains, we want some mesic forest, we want, you know, some xeric, you know, we want mid slope, we want concave, convex landforms. I mean, hopefully we're, we're capturing all of these because over time, the species Brian works with or others, you know, in those in, on those sites might change. I mean, we might get, right, more southern Appalachian types of species, depending on how long you're going out and what model you're looking at. You know, we could get much different forests, but the plants that will likely grow there will be xeric, you know, plants that are adapted to sandy soils or mesic soils. So from a landscape perspective, we still have a diversity of plants and forests because you know, we've, we've, we've conserved the, the different stages that allow those diversity of plants. Okay. Uh, Justin is, I think, making uh, an observation that the, one of the most important benefits of forests is stable and healthy wildlife populations. Um, that we've seen, uh, already seen forest loss and conversion, fragmentation, fire exclusion, invasive species, so forth, uh, and those impacts on wildlife species, and uh, making the case for the uh, importance of uh, the, uh, let's see, uh, making the case for the importance of early successional stages, um, young forest uh, conditions in support of some of those wildlife species. Okay. I guess the other thing I would mention that, that Brian's comment brings up to me is there, there's obviously, there's going to be times you're in, I don't know, wherever you are, in eastern Massachusetts or suburban Albany or suburban Madison, Wisconsin, or wherever you are, that, you know, things are developed. It's not, you know, at this point, it's not like uh, we're going to, you know, convert, you know, break up concrete and take houses down. But so it may be that in those areas, really focusing in on the connections as opposed to the core areas may be the better strategy and, and trying to, you know, or building off of the core areas you have, you know, it, whether it be land use planning and zoning or stepping up uh, in terms of outreach to specific landowners that help with those connections, you know, to me is part of maintaining the resiliency of that landscape. Okay, Donald is, uh, so, so Donald has a specific, and I think that this is, um, I see this question in kind of a bigger, uh, in a more general, not a bigger sense, a more general sense of how do you apply these principles in the face of like overwhelming stressors. And so his specific example is uh, there's been great impact to southern New England over the last three years with repeated gypsy moth, uh, defoliation by gypsy moth. Um, and he's seen oak mortality between 35 and 95 percent, I'm assuming, of stands in Connecticut, Rhode Island, um, and parts of Worcester County. Um, he, he's wondering, you know, your comments on that, I'm assuming relative to this, this the guidance of forest resiliency. So how do you deal with these? I mean, that's huge, right? If you have, let's just say, 40% or 60% mortality of oak in an oak-dominated stand, how do you deal with, you know, how do you get past that gargantuan stressor and move on towards a, a goal of resiliency? I, I, think, I think timing is important. You know, I think uh, whether you're timing, a sh you know, whether you're trying to implement a shelter wood or what have you, you've got to be in there at the right time. It just may be that, 
um, you know, this is that may not be the time to to be in there doing it, and you may need you know a growing season or a couple growing seasons to restore vigor to see how the the impact shakes out. So it might be that you know, depending on the the you know crown loss, I don't know if you're you know, if you meant 35 to 65 percent or so of the mortality of the basil of the oaks in that stand, you know, seeing how that shakes out in the next year or two, and then seeing where the opportunities may be, um, it's as you know, it, it really is as much art as it is science, and I, I think that's the beauty and the importance of forestry is that we have that long-term perspective. We 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 are comfortable with changing. <laughs> we almost thrive in changing conditions and applying our, our science in an artful way at the stand level. So, I, you know, I, I guess I would say to you to be vigilant of, you know, the other stressors in the landscape. That's why I put this slide up, how they're interacting, and then, you know, being judicious about, you know, wh when you're in there and, and to have the greatest effect. It just might be that that stand may not be, that may not be the time to be in there. Uh, I don't know if it provides an opportunity. I don't know if there's a, you know, if there's that much mortality, depending on the landowner's goals. If you know, if you're going to be in there and salvaging or not. If you are salvaging, you know, encouraging to be vigilant about uh, maintaining some standing dead wood and, and enough of the down dead wood, which I know is an, you know, can be an economic loss. But those big carcasses on the ground can be the can be the low quality uh, individuals as well. So, you know, trying to maintain structure, and if you are going to, you know, enter the stand um, to, to salvage some, some value out of that, um, you know, using that as an opportunity to help pay for, whether it be treatment of invasive plants, um, because you're going to be making money from the, from the oak sale, or, you know, looking at an opportunity to create some gaps or thinning out some other parts so, so the residual stand is more vigorous. So I, I would use that, you know, if, if you are going to go in there, um, try to apply some of these principles and, and use it as an opportunity, but being, you know, careful with the timing, make sure it's the best time. Okay. Uh, let's see. So there were many, many comments that said great presentation or some version of great presentation. So just so you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so Rolf says, are more complex or do, more co do the more complex forest ecosystems fix more CO2 per year in their soils than other land uses or forest types? Yeah. So as a generality, my answer to that would be yes, because if they have a greater complexity, they likely have, they're likely a more mesic soil, meaning that they have more moisture and more nutrients which is why they have that amount of complexity, because they have the raw material, so to speak, to, to actually grow that, that amount of, of complex amount of layers, understory, midstory, shrub layer, et cetera. So in doing so, um, it is likely that because there's more vegetation, there's more layers, it's sequestering more carbon because there's just more things growing, and therefore it's, it's probably storing more in the soil. So, so I would say yes. Okay, and then what do you see? Carl has a question about uh, the similarities, or just I'll generalize the similarities or dissimilarities between this method of management through forest resiliency or the principles of forest resiliency uh, and those principles of landscape ecology. Ooh, uh, I, th I, I think, I hope they intersect. You know, I think. Um, on one end, I guess if you put it on an end or a spectrum, it is forestry at the stand level. And, and again, I think that's one of the real pluses of, of forestry is that we take the larger concepts and we distill it down and put it into practice on the ground at a stand management unit level. Um, but that has to be done um, uh, in the context with the perspective of the, uh, of the landscape. So things like, you know, print landscape ecology principles like uh, connectivity and islands and patches; those are all really critical to resiliency because you you know you can you can crush it at the stand level, but if you're surrounded by you know uh, a, a landscape that's completely developed, yeah, you know, or, or or has you know low resiliency, it's it's not going to mean as much. So 
being conscious of where that stand is um, can also, in the landscape, can also inform what you do. You know, maybe there are opportunities on the north part of your parcel to add to, you know, uh, um, what's happening on the, on the other parcel next to you. You know, maybe there, there is an opportunity for a, a, a skip because the parcel next to you has really valuable endangered species habitat or has wonderful structure. And so you're going to extend that onto your property because we know the property lines don't matter to plants and animals. Um, or maybe it, you know, tells you that, that that's a better place for, for one of the gaps for whatever reason. So I think, I think it's the intersection of both. And I, I think forestry has, has um, and for good reason, and as I said, it's a strength, been focused on the stand level, but, but I, I think incorporating that only strengthens. And in fact, it amplifies the same units of energy. So for instance, if you're going to go in and do something in a stand, if you've taken in the landscape context, I think you can ant for the same amount of energy, time, and resources if planned well with the landscape consideration, you can have a larger impact. Okay, great. Well, I, it looks like the questions have come to a close, so I want to thank Paul for a fabulous presentation, thank the audience for fabulous questions. I mean, it's the questions that really add a lot of richness to the conversation, so I know, I know Paul appreciates, appreciates those, as do I. So I'm going to close this noon hour webinar. Uh, you're all welcome to come back at 7 p.m. Paul especially is welcome to come back <laughs> at 7 p.m. Um, and you, I hope you all have a great afternoon. It's uh, at least in central New York, it's sunny and 75. So a great day to uh, do something in the woods maybe. All right. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate thanks, Pete. I'll see you later. Yes. Thanks. <laughs>